smartest dumb band in the land, the Beastie Boys, mix heady grooves, smart samples, and lowest common denominator gut punches. This New York trio consists of Adam Horowitz, or King Ad Rock as he is otherwise known, Adam Yauk, aka MCA, and Michael Diamond, affectionately known as Mike D. The band's story started a long time ago, way back in the late 1970s. America, at the time, was facing the start of the Ronald Reagan era, and a new breed of disillusioned youth was beginning to come of age. This is the never-told-before story of the Beastie Boys' musical evolution. actually started life as two separate bands that would eventually evolve into one. Mike D's band was a four-piece group called the Young Aborigines. Who were the Young Aborigines? They were Mike and John and me mainly, um, but first it started out just as Mike and John. John Berry is a former member of the Beastie Boys from their original lineup. I played guitar. Jeremy played bass and uh, Mike played his drums. After a while, I got the notion to introduce my two best friends, Mike and John. I masterminded a, an introduction by uh, buying a ticket for uh, Joe Jackson. And as soon as the first band kicked into their thing, John started hugging like a maniac. I acted uh, wildly, jumping around. I'll never forget it. I mean, just in his chair. He didn't stand up. Just bouncing up and down. After their set ended, uh, John went to use the bathroom. And Mike turns to me and goes, this guy's insane. He goes, this guy's crazy. I don't know if I can deal with this guy. <laughs> Jeremy told me that uh, Mike thought that I was out of my mind and was wondering if there was anything really seriously mentally wrong with me. <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. He's cool. He's cool. Don't worry. He's good. He's a good guy. I don't, I've never been to a concert with him before. I never saw him act like that before, but obviously, you know, something about the music was <laughs> setting something off in him. And uh, so uh, after that, though, Mike warmed up to him. And we sort of um, discovered that we had the same interests in um, punk, and we both loved The Clash. I came up with a suggestion. I said, hey, well, why don't you guys play together, you know? And it was a, just a terrible, terrible combination of, because uh, none of us knew how to play, but I mean, we had a lot of enthusiasm. Let's say we were, for lack of a better word, a jam band. It's a terrible term, but it's just a band whacking off, basically. Here we got a picture of the young Aborigines and this is the only full frame print I've got. We've got John and Mike and me at John's house. You can see the beer bottles lined up on the wall there and the, some, you know, hubcap. Um, and in the back here, you can actually see a little bit of Kate's kit. Um, Kate's kit was made up of John's, of uh, Mike's old kit and this big conga drum that John's father had and a bunch of other stuff. You can see Mike's kit is pretty snazzy. Um, I had some bootleg bass and I think John had a Gibson SG and you can see there's like a plate of congealing food. It's just the details, it's, it's all right there.
The Young and the Useless were a hardcore punk band. They were a little bit younger than the Beastie Boys, Young Aborigines. Zadam Morovitz on guitar, Arthur Africano on bass, David Skilkin was lead singer, and I was the drummer. The Young and the Useless was Adam Horowitz's band. Adam Tracy was the youngest of the group. I think when I met them, I was still 12. And uh, I guess we probably rehearsed for a month or something before we started playing out. And so I may have turned 13 at the time. I don't think they knew anybody else that played the drums, maybe, at the time. But we didn't rehearse a whole lot anyway. And I think my dad bought me a drum set, so that helped too. The Young and the Useless played with us uh, several times, I believe, uh, at this great club called A7. And A7 was another haven for us hardcore kids. Most of us who should have been probably in bed, uh, who snuck out of their houses because it was a school night. And it was, uh, it was a great place to play. Yeah, we played our first gig here and I was so nervous. Our, our songs were extremely fast to begin with, but I was so nervous that I was playing like three times as fast as everybody else. And my sticks kept flying out of my hand. <laughs> and Adam, I just remember Adam like looking back at me like I was out of my mind. Pretty much like playing uh, in your living room uh, with a lot of drunken, scary uh, children. And the young and useless managed to blow everyone away. I was actually in a rehearsal studio with my other band, and the band that I formed in college. And next door was the Young and the Useless. And uh, I remember getting a quick look at them, and then it seemed like, next thing I knew, John Barry was out, mm -hmm. and Adam Horowitz was in. And I remember asking Mike why, and I guess mostly it had to do with uh, John showing up late, you know, not being on time for things. I was a bad, bad boy, and drank too much alcohol. I was doing a little experimenting. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Kids out there, stay away from the booze. Bad stuff for you. Terrible. The hardcore punk scene centered around a small record shop in New York's East Village called Rat Cage Records. Well, I remember first hearing about Rat Cage Records uh, in about 1981. And uh, they were, it was a little teeny store that was underground. Rat Cage was a record store on, the, on, uh, on 9th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. It was uh, just about across the street from the Selka Diner. It became a, um, just kind of a focus point, a place where you could go to get the new records, to get t-shirts, to get badges, you know. Um, Dave Parsons was the owner. I mean, Dave's shop stayed open till four in the morning at least. We'd just hang out there and eat and just hang out. I mean, it was sort of like base camp. Dave Parsons came up to us and said, hey, let's, let's record a record, um, which we were, of course, completely uh, excited about. He was really a big believer in the music and he actually started then recording people and started his little Rat Cage Records label. We went to a studio and we recorded the EP. Uh, Polywog Stew. The name they gave the EP, I, I can't remember, there, there was some reference, some inside joke between the four of them that uh, led to that title. It was a great experience and I learned a lot about um, actually trying to play the recording, which is a lot different than playing for an audience. It, it turned out great, you know, it was, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great thing. All the songs on there were about stuff that really happened, most of it, like Egg Raid on Mojo. I mean, that was a real incident. There was this guy named Mojo, and he was a bouncer at a club, and we hated him because he would never let us into the damn club. So we decided that, that there was going to be an egg raid on Mojo, that we were going to literally you know, do the old Halloween trick and take a dozen eggs and throw them at him. And now if this ever actually happened, I don't know. I was not there for the actual egg throwing. It may have happened. But nonetheless, these frustrations turned into the song, Egg Raid on Mojo. And you know, next thing you know, he was probably bouncing people out of the show that they were playing. They brought Adam Yauk into the fold while at the same time changing the name to The Beastie Boys. The 
Beasties were now an established part of the New York hardcore scene, even managing to get gigs at the legendary home of punk rock CBGBs. What is CBGBs? Everybody wants to know. Everybody knows. I don't have to tell anybody what CBGBs is, do I? It's a place where I think, you know, where we started what they call punk rock. To me, hardcore was like it came out of the punk rock thing, you know, the Sex Pistols and the Ramones, and um, it was faster than, than punk rock. It was a lot of slam dancing. It was. Um, very angry. So we were sort of the younger brothers and sisters of the punk movement. Two guitars, bass and drums, play really fast, vocals are shouted, you know, it's sort of a back to 76 punk. Yeah. The interesting thing about hardcore at the time, particularly in 1982 in downtown New York, was how immediate and accessible it was. You could sort of go to CBGB's on a, uh, I think they had the Saturday matinees, or Saturday or Sunday they would have a matinee, and that was the scene. Pretty much everybody there was the scene, and you could talk to anybody, and they would have a record out that was locally distributed, and, and that was it. It was very immediate. They would, they would like write a song, record it, and, and make a record. Hardcore? <laughs> well, I call hardcore punk is a... Is a Punk rock speeded up. The second time they recorded, without me this time, and with Adam Horowitz on guitar, they decided uh, to record this thing called Cookie Puss. And uh, Adam Horowitz basically crank called Carvel Ice Cream. They have a cake called the Cookie Puss. It's an ice cream cake for birthdays, you know. And he crank called the uh, store. Probably made someone's life miserable. And they, they put it all on tape. And it was brilliant. It was hilarious. No, it's terrible. Cookie Puss is terrible. They can't play. They had absolutely no ability as songwriters. It's like the worst hardcore record in the world. Chuck Klosterman has interviewed the Beastie Boys on many occasions. Had they remained in Cookie Puss and not became like a white rap band, you know, they'd all be working in record stores and Denny's now. There's no way they would have been successful. It was terrible. When I first heard Cookie Puss, I said, this is whack. <laughs> Dr. Dre is a hip hop legend and has known the Beastie Boys for many years. It was like this kind of weird record that sounded more hip hop than it did alternative but they were always considered like an alternative band thing. But it's cool because, I think it's cool retrospectively because people have, you know, they, they, they kind of see like the career arc of this band and you know, anytime something becomes super popular, it becomes this interest in like its origin. So. I always thought there was just gonna be some like underground, obscure, alternative band you never knew who, who died on acid one day, who knew? <laughs> Cookie Puss brought them to the attention of another unlikely rap fan, a long-haired student at New York University. They weren't really serious about punk music, and clearly they weren't serious because when someone said, hey, you should be a rap fan, they were like, okay, let's do that. So suddenly they got asked to, to play places and play Cookie Puss. Well, to do that, you really need a DJ. Okay. Rick Rubin was working out of his uh, dorm room in NYU. Ad Adam took me over there, and I met him, and uh, I thought, this is a guy who's, you know, very serious about um, taking these guys further. And I remember when they came to Rick and asked him, uh, will, you, will you DJ? Because Rick had the gear. you got to remember, Rick had, had the two turntables, the mixer, and the Big Sur in Vegas, so he actually could DJ. So suddenly, it was like they turned to, to Rick, and Rick Rubin became DJ Double R. DJ Double R. And, you know, he, he had interest in becoming a producer. And, you know, and obviously, like, he ended up becoming, you know, arguably, like, the most important producer of the 80s. But at the time, he was just this guy who just, I think, thought the Beastie Boys were really funny. I thought, wow, it's, you know, they've finally, you know, they've, they've got someone here who really cares about them and wants to uh, bring them to the forefront. He was a very ambitious guy, we all know. I mean, he was 
he was making records in the dorm room at NYU, right? I mean, that's the legend anyway. Um, he was very into rap and hip hop. And um, I think when he heard them or saw them, something must have just clicked in his mind. Adam Dubin is a friend and former roommate of Rick Rubin. It, it was really about the energy. It was what it was what Rick Rubin saw initially that there really wasn't this wide gulf between what punk was doing in its essence and what rap was doing in its early essence. It was still it, it, the energy was still there and the and the ability to just do something like like visceral and and angry. Rap music was new. It was underground. It was in the clubs. And when you played a rap record at a club or a party, it evoked the grandest emotion from everybody. I remember when Ruben was telling me, he was like, yeah, I got these parties to DJ with, with the Beastie Boys, and it was Cookie Puss. Well, Cookie Puss was way more successful than anything the Beastie Boys right. or Young and Useless or whatever other bands they were had ever done. So it was like, you know, it doesn't take too much of a genius to figure, well, that's a, that's a good road. So they kept going down that road. And then Rick Rubin's ideas kicked in. The one thing about rap music, you, you didn't have to sing, but you can rap. If you can rap, if you can get a rhythm, and you have the right beat, you can win. Now, if you talk to the Beastie Boys, they will tell you that like they always grew up, you know, in, you know, intertwined with African American culture, and it was just part of, you know, their life. Um, it's interesting because they all went to like kind of really exclusive, expensive private schools, and I sometimes wonder how many black kids that they really knew growing up. I'm sure it was some, but you know. Yo MTV Raps did give the Beastie Boys a considerable amount of credibility because I think a lot of, I mean, in the black community, they felt like, okay, the Beastie Boys are popular, but they're probably just popular because white people are writing about them and white people like them. Whereas Yo MTV Raps, remember the first time it was like black people saying to black people, it's like, you know, these guys, you know, they might be white and they seem like, you know, buffoons or whatever, but they're actually, you know, this is actually the kind of music you like too. So when they first walked on the stage, it was like, whoa, we white guys trying to rap. On stage, a white guy had to earn his stripes, and no one had done that yet. It's like if you went to the Apollo and you were a comedian, the audience in the rap in rap at that time was just like the audience, the black audience at the Apollo, which a white audience sits there and goes, okay, entertain me. A black audience goes, what you got? What you got, sucker? Basically, because they they want to be entertained. In your head, but a fat is not just for me; it's for you. Cause God wants and I think it probably seemed maybe. I mean, I, I mean, I'm white guy, so I know. But I, I always wonder if maybe in the black community, if the Beastie Boys almost seemed like a novelty. It was sort of like, isn't it kind of charming that these guys, you know, want, want to make the kind of music that we invented? You know? This woman walked over to me. He said, "I know you're the backbone of all of this." because those three white boys don't know what they're doing. And I was like, wow, that's just really presumptuous of yourself. You know, that was really, really presumptuous of them. And when the Beasties first came on, they were not greeted with, with widespread approval, but usually by the end of their, of their set, they would have won the audience over. And they did that pretty quickly. We did a show in Virginia, and you had 5,000 little black girls screaming and hollering, trying to get to them. Wanting to have a good time and, and loving the guys just generally because of they were real with what they were trying to say. They weren't trying to be black. They were trying to be the Beastie Boys. And it worked and it translated. The music translated, not the color. The reason why Beastie Boys sounded, you know, they, they just made good records. DJ Red Alert is recognized and respected worldwide as one of the founding fathers of hip hop. When I was playing in 86, there was a club called Union Square and it was predominantly black. And at that time, there was two records that were so popular. One was Who Would Now Hit It and Paul Revere. And to us, it sounded good. We didn't care what nationality it was. It just sounded good. We like, what's this? But it caught our attention. That it, was, it sounded funky. Some of the stuff that sounded funky, we liked it. Uh, the beats were very aggressive. So in hip hop, we always loved aggressive beats as far as Stuff like from Aerosmith, stuff like from Queen, stuff uh, Billy Squire, ACDC. So those kind of beats were kind of similar to what they were doing with the alternative beats, with the big drums and the big bop, 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 boom, bop, and all that craziness. Uh, all we did is just scratch it. So you heard the zig zig boom, boom, da, zig boom, boom, bop. 
So we always used the same, like similar beat. So it was kind of like right there on the same thing. But uh, it was the commentary and the delivery that was a little different. Sometimes being a black member of a white group had its drawbacks. The time we went to perform uh, over by Fenway Park in Boston, and it was myself and a guy named Say City, and they said, you guys got to go around the back because, you know, we don't have black people in this club. And we're like, what? Are you kidding me? And they stood up and said, yo, if they can't come through, we not coming through. And it caused such a big rush. They said, just go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And I heard them say, like, when we were coming by, the guy goes, nigga love us. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. This is like, come on, man. This is 1986, 87. This is crazy. How could you, where'd, where'd that come from? Boys were slated to open for Run DMC on the Raising Hell tour. The tour was special because it was the first time rap music would be given such global exposure. Um, Rick was out to being their DJ and owning a label called Def Jam at the time. A very small little label, had a group called Hole on it for real. This was long before LL Cool J, long before the Beastie Boys. This is how it really started out. He had just got off the road with them with Madonna. And he said, yo, I can't do this, I'm trying to run a label. And he was trying to always get me to come do stuff for the label. So he said, yo, why don't you DJ for them for me? Hook me up, hook me up. I was like, Rick, I don't know him like that. So he invited him over to his dorm room. I came over, we hung out all night long, had a good time. I said, sure, let me, I'll DJ for me from time to time, whatever. So we did a couple of gigs down in, in the village. And they were like, yo, you're great, you know what you're doing, this is cool. And that's how the relationship started. From then on, we just kept doing shows. Dr. Dre became the Beastie Boys DJ. But life on tour wasn't always great. And we had just done a show out in, um, I forgot the name of the stadium out there, but it was like the hottest, I mean, the hottest day of the year. It was like 150 degrees. I mean, you could fry an egg on the concrete without trying. It was that freaking hotter than this room right now. I mean, so I was sweating my balls off, I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, Dre was definitely in an uncomfortable situation. I would say that for sure. DJ Hurricane started off as part of Run DMC's entourage in the mid-1980s. Being on that little bus with those wild dudes, and it's hot. Air conditioning our bus broke down, so we had to go back to a hotel and take turns taking showers and then going off. Yeah, I remember that, because they had a bullshit bus. It was like a, in, a handicap van or something. It wasn't a bus at all. I went back, and being a DJ, you're always the last guy to leave, the, leave any venue. I went back, they crowded up the room, I couldn't get in. I said, oh, God, I'll take a shower when I get to the next stop. I think I told Sean, I'm gonna go to sleep here on this couch. Wake me up when y'all ready to go. I'll be here. He got left, I remember that. He was pissed. When I woke up, there was nobody there. Everybody left, they like left me there. And luckily, Houdini's bus was there. And I jumped on Houdini's bus and I was pissed off. I was like, I can't believe you guys left. Well, I'm stupid. You just can't leave me in the middle of nowhere. It's crazy. Yo, Dre, we couldn't find you. I said, find you? I was in the middle of the lobby on a couch, sleeping. And I was sleeping because I was on 150 degrees out in Miami with no AC, frying my ass off. Yo, you crazy. And you know, we, you know I told Orkin, I said, I gotta take a break. I gotta go. It's beginning to piss me off. But oh, Midway through the Raising Hell tour, Dr. Dre parted with the Beastie Boys. So then they came and asked me, yo, can you DJ for us? And I was still like really hesitant because back then, you know, I was so cool. I thought I was just so cool, you know what I'm saying? Growing up in Hollis, Queens, being with Run DNC and them, and you know, they wanted me to DJ for some white dudes that was very unheard of back then, you know, white guys rapping and they was wild and they was throwing stuff all over the place. I said, all right, I'll do it. But I never thought that I would just keep doing it. I thought it was going to be a temporary thing. The Raising Hell tour was the craziest tour I've ever been on in my life. And that tour opened the doors for hip hop completely. That broke the barriers down. That tour got so much publicity and it sold out so many concerts for the first time in hip hop that everybody was like, wow. That tour really opened doors because you got to see a little bit of both worlds between Beasties 
Run DMC, but a host of other people that was on that tour. So I know it, they say it, it broke barriers. It was this wild scene, you know, girls screaming, this uh, giant Budweiser can on the stage. They're squirting beers on people, you know, and it, it was funny, you know. I just thought, man, that's, you know, basically what we were doing as punk rock kids. Yes, it was, there was all the debauchery of sex, drugs, and rock and roll going on all the time. The Beastie Boys' foul-mouthed, crotch-grabbing antics were about to make them notorious. I remember just coming in our dressing room was like the worst thing you could do. You know, if you come into our dressing room, you might get hit in the head with a can of beer. So I might squirt some uh, whipped cream in your face. Anything could happen to you if you came inside the dressing room. Anything. The other problem was, and this was a major problem, was they didn't realize, none of us realized, yeah. that half their fans were 11 year old and 12 year old kids, 14 year old kids. And at that time, 14 year old kids were not as sophisticated as they are now. They, would, they had a, a gigantic inflatable penis on their tour. They had the beer show where they poured beer all over everybody. They did all kinds of crap. And this is just a, a stripper in a cage. And this is just, you know, on stage. The attention they got, here at least, had much more to do with sort of like obscenity. They toured America with Madonna. They were like the opening act for Madonna. So all of a sudden, all these 12 and 13 year old girls were kind of being exposed to the, you know, this band who was uh, you know, overtly sexual and had lots of phallic imagery on stage and, and almost seemed to be presenting themselves as like potential molesters. Oh my gosh! But on stage, they're doing all this crazy stuff. They're cursing. They're uh, they're pouring beer. Their their girls are dropping their tops, and you've got 11 year old kids in the audience with their with their families, with their moms and dads who brought them to the show. That's where the real trouble started. Today, the Beastie Boys, an American band calling itself the nastiest group in the world, arrived in London. They'd flown in from Europe, where apparently they daubed the walls of their hotel with human excrement, wrecked one bar, and in another, ended up throwing beer at other customers. I remember first going overseas and people knowing who I was. It really kind of bugged me out the first time I went over there. To get off the plane and seeing people run up to you saying, yo, what's up, DJ Hurricane? Yo, what's up, man? We love you, boom, 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 boom. Kind of really to make you say, dag, man, this stuff is really big now. But the controversy really kicked in when the Beasties toured Europe. The British um, papers out there made up a lie and said that the Beastie Boys is laughing at crippled kids. And when we got to Europe, everybody was like protesting us like really crazy, like, like they wanted to kill us. Yeah. I think it's a shame that you have to write right. articles and make a lies to sell your papers. Right. It's really stupid. <laughs> Beastie Boys, a band of few words, most of them unprintable. I remember getting to Liverpool and doing a concert. As soon as I got on the turntables, started scratching, people started throwing beer cans at me, talking about fully loaded beer cans. And I'm like ducking, like, I mean, one was coming towards my face and I ducked. I was like, yo, y'all gotta stop throwing this stuff, right? So I'm thinking, all right, let me hear bring the guys out here, maybe they'll calm down. As soon as they came out, it got worse. It was like, OK Corral, it was like we was running from bullets. It was like throwing all kind of stuff at us. Then I remember, um, I believe it was MCA picked up something and threw it back in the crowd, and it hit somebody. And the next thing you know, the police was at the hotel looking to arrest somebody. In 1986, the Beastie Boys released their debut LP, Licensed to Ill. The album was interpreted as a mindless, obnoxious party record. When Licensed to Ill came out, that was amazing to all of us in Mike, because it went to number one. It was the fastest selling debut record in Columbia history. The, the big single is Fight for Your Right to Party, which is the song that like the Beastie Boys now all hate and will basically, uh, it's hard to even get them to talk about it. Um, it. It's certainly the closest like hybrid between like the kind of punk rock they were making and Cookie Puss 
and then the kind of like suburban white hip hop. And Spice for Your Right to Party wasn't a hip hop record, but it was, they were a hip hop group. So by them making that record and having hip hop fans made them get rock fans, more rock fans to listen to hip hop also. It's a really straight song, it's a really flat song, and there again, it's, you know, when I see mean flat, I mean, it's just sort of like, it's not really innovative, it's just basically like the kind of song you would write if you were an eighth grader. The world was introduced to the boys with their top ten single and video, You Gotta Fight For Your Right To Party. You could have put black and white leader on that song and shown it to MTV and it would have been a hit. In fact, maybe we should have put black and white leader on it and shown it to MTV because it might have been a hit anyway. Uh, virtually any video for that song would have been big, but would, have been, would it have been as big as this? No, because this video also put the Beasties on MTV bragging about how great they were. It was designed to be played for MTV it, because MTV at the time wasn't going to play Paul Revere. It wasn't going to play the new style. But they knew this song, you could do a great frat rap song, like you said, and visually it would work, and it would get them on MTV and get them set up. And that's what it did for now. All the people that you see in that video are friends of theirs. I mean, there's the guys from Murphy's Law in right. there. There's Jimmy, Ever, Gestapo. Jimmy Gestapo. I mean, there's, there's all these people are just friends. because the star in MTV. Yeah. BJ, right. No, no ever Rick Rubin showed up. I mean, everybody was just friends. The video includes a lot of people getting hit in the face with pies. And what's kind of important about that is the sense that even, you know, even to a 13-year-old kid in 1985, that's sort of stupid, that's sort of like a kind of like a comedic value from the 50s or whatever. But that's kind of what they were, it was like conscious stupidity. My mother and father played the parents in the video, and actually, they looked pretty funny. Yeah, and it, what was great was that at the very end, the, the last visual joke is that the mother comes home, sees the destruction wrought by the Beastie Boys in, in the apartment, and is like looking around bewildered, and then she then gets a pie in her face. No, nobody had the heart to like throw the pie in her face because everyone, even though she was like, it's fine, just do it, you know. Yeah, she was dying to take the I pie mean, in she, her face. I mean, she was just, nobody really had the heart. So finally what we had to do is nobody could really throw it. So they framed up a very tight shot of her face. That's right. And it's Rick's hand and he just has the pie in his hand and very just it. slowly like I smushed pushes the pie it into in her, her face. Into her and it was perfect because she had glasses on, yeah. which meant it wouldn't get in her eyes, which was great. But the glasses got all fogged right, the, the pie. The pie she falls got a pie away. In her face. And, then, yeah. and I remember on MTV they said, uh, one of the guys who directed this threw the pie in his mother's face at the end. Nice going, kid. Right. Well, that controversial American band, the Beastie Boys, is being blamed for a curious crime currently sweeping the Southeast. <laughs> Last month, sales of VW emblems rocketed by 130%. 6,500 of these were sold, mostly to young people who wanted to stick them around their necks. We started it. No, I was going to no. say that we stole many but th in the that was, that was his thing. I mean, he, yeah, but he started started, they started the wearing that. We, what, about the ripping off of the... Um, yeah, thing? that's what I thought. I mean, we, we heard about... We heard about that kind of stuff. Not specifically that there was, it was, it was necessarily all the rage, but I mean, you, you knew where they were getting this stuff and they weren't paying for it legally or anything. I mean, you knew all that was, what was kind of the, the cool thing about it was that they would, you know, um, anybody who was wearing an emblem from a car, you'd know they'd stolen it from right. a car. And, and that was kind of the, the thing about it. So Mike D really, I think, started the VW thing himself. I mean, I, you know. Yeah, nobody... knowing Mike, he probably paid for it. No, I, don't know. I mean, I think a lot of actually what we were putting out that we were definitely enjoying ourselves and having a good time, but hopefully not harming anybody else. A number of things happened because of that video. Apparently, some kid had a fight for your right to party party in uh, somewhere in the United States and almost burned down his house. Uh, and I, I felt a mixture of sadness and, and pride. Like they were making it very clear that like, you know, it's not that we just seem dumb, it's like we want to be as dumb as possible, which I think really relates to people of that age who are looking to be absurd for no reason all the time. Yeah. Everybody wanted us to perform that song on their TV show, in their cities, at their birthday parties. Without really trying, it kind of became this very, like, like an a themic song, like an anthem for the, their mindset at the time. Wherever 
they can get us to go and do that song, they got us to go do it. That song was was huge. That song was the one I would say sold all those records for License to Hill. The kind of people buying that record could relate to it, I guess, because they wanted to have parties, you know? It was amazing. It was, it was a huge selling record. I remember feeling very proud. I always tell the story about my mother because uh, she likes to say when, when Mike used to come over here to my house, he, would, he wouldn't talk to her, he wouldn't make eye contact, he would just mumble something and walk on down to my room. And she always had the same thought, this kid is not going to amount to anything. She always say that. And uh, then Fight for Your Right comes out and she's dancing to it at an after ski bar, you know, at the ski slope. During 1988, they became involved in a bitter lawsuit with Def Jam and Rick Rubin, who claimed that he was responsible for the group's success. The group finally managed to break away and relocated to California. And all of a sudden, it gets to a point in 1987 where, wait a minute, there's a lot of money at stake, and they're like, hey, we want to be a part of that. They didn't say we want it all, but they were like, we're, you know, suddenly you look at your contract and you realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm only getting like this piece and, you know, record company's getting this piece and the record company's Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons. And a big lawsuit followed and, and basically Rick and they split. And I think that's, that's part of the, the problem is they, they see that as before they became in control and, of their own yeah. destiny, though they had a lot to do with the videos. The breakup of, of the Beastie Boys and Rick Rubin came about um, basically because they, learn the harsh lesson that many uh, performers learn, which, which when you get successful, you are, all of a sudden you, you want to have, let's say, you realize how little of your, yourself and your own success you're, you're entitled to. In 1989, the Beastie Boys released Paul's Boutique. The musical style was entirely different to License to Ill. Many observers didn't know what to make of it. Paul's Boutique came out, they'd, like, they'd went to Los Angeles, um, you know, they were smoking a lot of pot and being in like, that was sort of the aesthetic of that record, this sort of this laid back stoner kind of hip hop. This was all like, and it probably involves more samples than any major record ever released, in the sense that like you could not afford to make Paul's Boutique now with copyright laws. People were really cracking down on the use of samples and the use of material. I mean, there are I, I, there are hundreds and hundreds of, you know, there'll be just like you know a snippet of a Bowie song that just you know and like all, all these things they could never you could never make that record now. Like that's the end of like widespread sampling. People didn't really catch on to it. People was expecting License to Ill, so they didn't really respect Paul's boutique. They make this record, um, and almost no one pays attention to it, because it's not as superficially funny or as sort of uh, aggressively obnoxious. All the things that sort of made them famous initially, which really were kind of the baggage of License to Ill, that's all gone. I remember, I remember when Paul's boutique first came out and we started doing shows, and the record sales didn't jump off the way they supposed to. And everybody was looking kind of down about it, like, you know, oh, this is it, it's over. Well, I know Adam Young said that, like, he thought it was gonna be huge. Like, they were, they were working under the premise that, like, okay, if this last record sold 12 million, and this record is so much better, and it's so much more serious, you know, it's gonna be like Fleetwood Mac's rumors. It's gonna just be massive, and then it did. And I, I don't know really how it affected them because I think that, you know, I, success happened to them so quickly and changed their life so dramatically that I don't know if they were really prepared to make a successful record every two or three years. I think that they were probably very close to end this band. We went from visiting big arenas to smaller ones. So it was definitely a gut check, I think. You know, either you're down or you ain't down. Either you're gonna jump off the ship now or you're not. I just get the impression that that as personalities, their life had all changed and, you know, one was dating Iona Sky, who was an actress, they were doing all these other things, you know. And I think in, in a sense maybe that 
that when Paul's Boutique didn't do as well commercially, they were sort of like, well, okay. Like, we, you know, we, we still made all this money off our first record, we did all these tours, you know, and this record we liked, but it didn't do as well. You know, we'll just see what happens. Maybe this is the last record we'll ever make. Like now, retrospectively, kind of the, the conventional thing to say is that the best Beastie Boys record is Paul's Boutique. But almost no one bought it when it came out. And it was completely an extension of this idea that a lot of people didn't take them seriously at License to Ill. And then it was later that people started kind of rediscovering it. But there's actually a lot of people who say they bought Paul's Boutique when it came out or why. But now, people love Paul's Boutique, you know? Same people that probably didn't like it back then, when they go back and listen to it now, they love it. Check Your Head, the album they released in 1992, was the first record since the hardcore days where the Beasties played their own instruments. The LP re-established the Beastie Boys as a musical force in the alternative scene. And I think we just decided to, to start playing again, so we kind of picked up the instruments, we kind of did it again, like came back in a different style when we picked them up, just kind of trying something else out. Check your head. Well, I was at college at the time, and it seemed like a big record there. Now I, I can't, you know, I'm sure it went platinum. Um, their video, like uh, the video for "What You Want," was on MTV quite a bit. It had to have done pretty well, but it was super popular among like serious music fans at the time. Like, Check your head was. I think that was a, a really good genius album because it went from just making an all hip hop album to making a whole complete album of hip hop, a little rock, a little punk, and some little instrumentals. I mean, they were one of the first kind of outfits where it seemed like that they were like very consciously and very clearly merging hard rock and hip hop, and that while they were together, they still had sort of autonomous identities. You know? That record became a big deal because it was sort of this kind of social and universal discovery that, oh, actually the Beastie Boys, they aren't, weren't just this funny band, they're actually like this brilliant band, like, like they have, like, they're, they're, there's a lot of musicianship here and a real understanding of like how things are supposed to sound. Real, real By the time they made Check Your Head, the musical climate had completely changed, in the sense that all of us, like, there was this new interest in alternative music as the mainstream. The response to Check Your Head was incredible. People loved it. People loved to see instruments. Like, when you came to the show and Check Your Head, I mean, it was never done before. Now, you, Nowadays, you see people like uh, Limp Bizkit and other rock bands trying to do what we did back then, which was pick up instruments, scratching, with the instruments, rapping with instruments, and putting it all together in one type of, on, on one plate. I mean, people were revising their, their take on the Beastie Boys, but they were revising it in a way that was more accurate. That these weren't just personalities, these were actually like a very sort of talented and sophisticated band. I mean, that's the biggest thing Check Your Head did. It kind of made people come to the conclusion that the Beastie Boys were musically sophisticated, which had not been the case in the past. In 1994, Ill Communication was released. Its style was quite similar to Check Your Head, but this time it was more hip hop focused. Like Sabotage to me is, is a, a very clear example of like how the Beastie Boys have been always able to stay just slightly ahead of like the cultural curve in the sense that when that came out in 1994, the one thing that seemed to really interest them a lot and was of great interest to this huge mass of, of listener who hadn't, I guess, been able to experience this, was this sudden interest in the 1970s and 70s culture. So when they made the Sabotage video, which was really like sort of a mock send up of like American cop shows from the 70s like Starsky and Hutch and Beretta and stuff, like that was the first time people heard that song and saw those images. They like, because MTV basically broke that song and people really liked the video. And they like, it was directed by Spike Jones and it was really funny and it was really cool. And it basically then positioned now the Beastie Boys as like, uh, 
where they had been previously like a college rock band. Now they were like, you know, like a major alternative rock band and sort of really like one of the first rap rock bands. To me, that was like my favorite Ill Communication because the tours that we did on Ill Communication, the way we used to rock the crowd when we did Sabotage and um, Sure Shot and those songs like that, I mean, the crowds used to go so crazy from the shows we used to do. I mean, I wish I had some of them on video. It was just phenomenal. That was a hot year. You know, the Beastie Boys have suddenly decided that they're now sort of like statesmen. They're kind of like, there's a diplomatic element to them, you know, and they're from New York. So like this record's like a tribute to New York and the five boroughs of New York. And But I mean, they have a song on it called uh, like To the Five Boroughs, or no, oh no, an open letter to NYC. They have a song called an open letter to NYC. And they basically just name places. Like they'll name certain locations and certain subway lines and stuff. And it's more like, you know, like reading the Zagat's Guide. It's like a tutorial to like hearing where things in New York are, but. Still, even now to, to play, you know, they haven't had a record out in six years. They just had a record out. It was the number one record. Right. And if you'd ask anybody in 1987, will the Beastie Boys have a number one record, um, what is it, uh, 15 years later, more than 15, six, more 17 than years later, that they'll Make it an even 20. 20. Almost 20 years later, which they, could they come out? Everybody thought, well, I mean, they'll have a, a good album. They had a really good year and, and a couple of good songs. But nobody would have thought that they were, they were going to uh, have hit albums. I will, they probably going to, they probably tour with this record and I, it'll be a while before they make another one. I mean, they work slow. They work kind of, you know, part of what makes them cool sort of is that they, they kind of work on their own schedule. There probably won't be another Beastie Boys record for four or five years. After a trekking holiday through Tibet, Adam Yauk was suddenly drawn to the plight of the people there, whose country and culture was being occupied by China. He decided to stand up and do something about it, resulting in the first Tibetan Freedom Concert, held over two days in June 1996. There was just this big interest in the middle 90s in the United States about free Tibet. And you would see it on bumper stickers on cars and you would hear people talking about it and it became kind of like, it was like a hipster cause. Like cool kids all of a sudden were taking this interest in, you know, China's occupation of Tibet and Adam Yauk is one of the guys who like, you know, and I read about it in Newsweek or something, and he was like, yes, this is important. So he became this sort of this very forward thinking, very aggressive proponent of like freeing Tibet. And I never really got beyond saying Tibet should be free, but it kind of became like his cause. I don't know, they took it real serious. I don't know, I don't know. I just kind of said to myself, yeah? With the Dalai Lama? Yeah, the Dalai Lama? <laughs> okay, okay, I can go with it, I guess. I guess he found us in a piece. Got me on that one. <laughs> Bill, come on, do something for us here. What are you giving us? It's one of these causes where you can't really disagree with it. I mean, who's going to say like, yeah, well, I think China should be able to like rob these monks of their culture. I mean, no one's going to disagree with freedom for Tibet, you know? I just, I just always think it's funny whenever I see like a free Tibet bumper sticker or like a Beastie Boys teacher that says free Tibet is like, well, <laughs> I don't know how that's going to manifest itself in any freedom, but you know, it's good you're thinking about it. But. To me, it was, it was basically doing another concert. You know, I mean, Yak wanted to do it for that cause. So it was cool with me and it was cool with everybody else to support him and what he wanted to do. What should, what, what should really be happening is that all of us should be thanking the Tibetan people and the Chinese people who are here who are speaking out. Uh, we should be thanking them for participating in this nonviolent struggle. Anytime you try to do a political rock concert, you know, anytime you're trying to do something with a political purpose and you get all these big bands, it gets a lot of attention at first for its political leanings, but then it just becomes like, oh, look at all the good bands who are playing. 
-hmm. Like, and then it just becomes like a Woodstock event. And it's like, you know, you got people going to that show who, you know, wouldn't care if like Tibet got attacked by Godzilla, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't even think of this. So when I got on stage, you know, I thought of it as, let's, let's go to work. Let's do what we supposed to do. You know, when, that, when that concert was going on, it just started to be like, oh wow, what a great show this is, because it was like Beastie Boys and Pearl Jam and a whole you know, menagerie of other big acts. And then I think somebody got struck by lightning and died, and that was the main thing everyone remembers. You know? Although the Beasties were extremely successful, not everyone associated with the band was happy. I would say the reason why I'm, I parted was because it was like, the Beastie Boys would work like every five, six years. And for me, you know, I got a family. I need to be constantly working. And, you know, it wasn't really benefiting me and my family to like work every five years. I remember like several times I'd be up there and like, you know, wouldn't even really, really be into it as much as I used to be into it. Financially, I felt like I should have been getting more than what I was getting. You know, like if you go to work and you're not happy with how much money you're making, when you're at work, you're not going to be happy. You know what I mean? It don't matter what kind of job you're doing. If you go to work and you're like, man, I, don't, I should be making some more money than what I'm making, then you're not going to be all the way concentrating, all the way there. And that's how I felt. I felt like I should have been getting making more money than what I was making as far as how long I was down. After 12 years of loyal service, DJ Hurricane decided to leave the band. spent time with the band always takes away special memories. The boys' true personalities are always hidden behind their comedic alter egos. But what are they really like? I first met Mike uh, through my brother, actually, because my brother was best friends with Mike's older brother, his oldest brother, David. And so it just sort of naturally happened that I became interested in Mike when we crossed paths. We gradually just got more and more into music. That became, you know, we sort of put away childish things, you could say, and just became record fanatics. Mike D is the dude that, you know, he's the guy that when the mic comes on, he wants to be the dude to be talking. He wants to take care of all the business part of everything. He wants to be the spoken dude of the group. Well, not wants to be, he is, basically. For me, Mike D was the quiet one who was very smart, though, as well. He was very smart, quiet, and in terms of the videos, he was the one that asked for the most direction. Considering um, what he had for drums, he was a damn good drummer. He had pretty much the, the lowest form of just bargain basement drum set, you know. He worked it as well as he could. Ooh, I got you down with this. Adam Harvard, the actor of the group, uh, he was always the, he was, I would say he was the emotion of the group. He, he was like the heart and the soul. Like, he, he believed in this, like this was his life's work. This is what he had to do. He believed in being ad rock. That was his thing. I really looked up to Adam Horvitz. I thought he was extremely funny and uh, he always wore like really cool clothes. His mom had a, uh, clothing store. I don't know whether we all dressed like Adam or we all just dressed that way ourselves, but the whole like baseball cap and, you know, uh, t-shirt, I don't know. I mean, it just seemed like what we were all wearing. And then it became this whole uh, uniform in the 90s, early, late 80s. Um, yeah, I always thought Adam was hilarious. He was just one of the funniest people I knew. He enjoyed being in front. If there was a front man to the Beastie Boys, it would be Ad Rock. Yak would be the sexy guy, and Mike Diamond, he's, the, he's honestly the manager, believer, backbone in, in, in his own vein. But it would be Ad Rock as the, the, the step out front guy. You know, he, he was like the leader of the Young and Useless. It was his band, so, and I, you know, because he was a couple years older, I mean, those were, that's a big age difference then. And, you know, I always looked, it up, looked up to him and thought he was, you know, like, you know, whatever he thought was right was probably right. And, you know, he was really funny and smart. And, 
You know, so I always had this like kind of little brother feeling around around him. Adam Horowitz was actually at the time probably, although I knew all three of them, was the one I was the closest to. He was the son of uh, the famous playwright and sometimes screenwriter Israel Horowitz, and we became pretty friendly the minute Adam told me that his father had co-written an Italian gangster film with John Cassavetes, which he didn't take credit for, called Machine Gun McCain, that I loved. Well, Adam Horowitz was like, you know, Ad Rock, my, like my favorite because he, he's the dude that I would say like I can relate to the, the most because he's just like so cool, you know what I'm saying? Like he'll always call me and you know, say what's up Kane, he'll speak to my wife and, and you know, ask me how the kid's doing. He's, I would say Ad Rock is definitely my, my closest friend when it comes down to being, you ask, if you're asking me out of all three, Ad Rock is definitely the man. Horvitz, uh, to me, was like, um, he was the actor of three. He had had acting experience. In fact, he had acted as a teenager, as a very young teenager. He had acted on stage and they had said, you know, he's like a young Cagney or something like that. The one who would do anything for, for a joke type guy. He was the Jerry Lewis of the three. Yeah, MCA. Um, very cool, very reserved, very funny guy. Um, I always like hanging out with y'all because we always would do like crazy stuff, you know, by ourselves and hang out and we talk and, you know, y'all would drink scotch and I would drink scotch with him and we just talk stuff for a while. Very reserved, cool guy, very, very cool guy. Like a Buddhist monk. <laughs> like you can't, you can't really do nothing around him that, that he's gonna think is, is wrong without him like, Yo, dude, man, you should stop. Oh, yo, dude, that ain't cool. Type of dude. He's just so, so gentle, man. Now it's, you know. Yauk was a little more, was the most assertive of the three in terms of wanting his independence the most, in terms of being the most independent and the most outspoken. And, and um, he was sort of laid back. He wasn't the quietest of the three, but. He was, he, was, he was laid back, he gave a lot of thought to what he wanted to do, and they all did in fact. I mean, they worked together, but he was usually the ringleader of whatever idea they came up with um, in terms of anything that they came up with. I think he would sort of become the spokesman at certain times. One night, you know, we were listening to records, and uh, he had this um, detonation plunger. You can see in the cartoons, you know. Plunger thing uh, to detonate bombs, and uh, he liked to he liked to make explosives. One night, we decided to blow up the neighbor's yard. So he snuck over the yard, and jumped over the fence, planted a bomb, uh, and he took the wire back, trailed it back up into his room, and. Uh, Set off a bomb. I don't know if it went off. I don't know if it went off at all. <laughs> we just, you know, maniacally laughed, and uh, you know, it was just, you know, it was, it was funny. You know, it was just, uh, there's no reason for it. You know, but it was just, you know, it was silly. You know, I think he got in a lot of trouble for that, actually. an existence that's bridged nearly two decades, the Beasties seem incapable of resting on their laurels and just offering retreads of their earlier work. For a band that was written off as a one-joke novelty act the moment they came to mass attention, they haven't done that badly. But they'll loom pretty large in, in rock and roll history as probably as the first valid white rap act. They have proved people wrong a lot. They, no one thought that they would have more than one record. Beastie Boys make occasions. We might say in general, yeah, they doing black sound. But still in all, they come across the message to everybody. To me, music is music. 
they're good people too. They're they're always interested in other bands and helping. They're very good. I mean, to have been around for this long, first of all, they're going on. I mean, what is that? 23 years. I mean. It's a huge accomplishment, and they've kept their heads, you know, they've really survived. So many years later, they're not really just a footnote in, in music, they actually are able to, to pack, you know, arenas. In fact, every white act, whether they want to believe it or not, including Kid Rock and guys like that, they may be, or, or Eminem, they may be different, but every white act that does rap owes something to them just like every white rock and roll guy owes something to Elvis. I would sum him up as being one of the, uh, one of the greatest uh, hip hop groups to uh, live. You know, definitely one of the top. Their ability to continue to grow and reinvent themselves and stay new. That's their legacy. They're, they're still valid, they're still doing it, and they're still doing it well, and they've still got a sense of humor about themselves, which is a very key yeah. thing, so uh, their legacy will, uh, will loom large. At least as big as Michelangelo. At least as big as Michelangelo, if, yeah. you know, if not as big as Titian. Except they don't work on feelings. No, no. Oh.